Well, good evening, and uh, and uh, I'm glad you could join me for this Wednesday night uh, devotion on Psalm uh, chapter 32. We've been going through the Psalms to kind of glean from them devotionally. And again, when you go to the Psalms, pray. Uh, ask the Lord to speak to you. You know, we get so caught up sometimes, I do, studying and looking at all the commentary and all. No, no, no. I'm talking about just for the love of Scripture, for the love of hearing God's voice, open up the Psalms and read the beautiful poetry, the beautiful song there, and, and see what it has to say for you. You don't have to have to take apart every line. And if there's something you don't understand, don't worry about it. Uh, uh, go and look at the things you do understand and how God would have you apply them to your lives. So Psalm 32 is, is called, it's called a Psalm of David. Now, some Bibles have that information in them for you. Some don't. But Psalm of David, and it's called a maskel. Now, that's a, a transliteration of the Hebrew. Hebrew word looks nothing like that. And it, it is a psalm that was meant to give instruction. That's what maskel means. Uh, to to, to uh, help you to, to understand or to help your understanding. And so this psalm is meant to instruct us. And it is to instruct us concerning the nature of forgiveness. Now, forgiveness is a pretty big thing. I mean, it's part of the doctrine of salvation that Christ came so that we might have the forgiveness of sins. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Day of Atonement and the sacrificial system, all about forgiveness, a covering over uh, an atonement of sins until Christ, the new covenant, came. And so we have this nature of forgiveness. And to be forgiven is a great thing in Scripture. And to give forgiveness is a great thing. And all of life is maybe being forgiven and forgiving because we're such, we're such broken sinners. So David begins by reminding us of the blessedness of forgiveness, the happiness uh, of forgiveness. And he uses the word blessed two times. I mean, to be forgiven and to know that you are forgiven. Oh, blessed, blessed, he tells us two times in this psalm. Verse verse 1, just to glean if you think, blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. And again, this is a song. This is poetry. And, and it begins with this blessedness. I mean, the blessedness of forgiveness. The blessedness of having our sins covered, a sacrifice being made for our sins. That God won't hold us accountable for things because there's a covering, a covering for our sins. And that's the rhyme. The first part of verse 1, blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven. And it rhymes with whose sins are covered. And again, verse 2, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. And the rhyme, and in whose spirit is no guile, is no deceit. And what's that talking about is, is a man who has a clean spirit because he's forgiven. Because the man who sinned the Lord does not count against him. And, and there is no deceit and he's not hiding sin in his heart. He's all confessed up, we might say. He's all prayed up. There's no hidden sin in his life. Just the blessedness of God of having those sins forgiven. Now, now to have a spirit with no deceit is to lead a life that's open to God. He knows anyway. You can't hide sin from him. So confess it. Forsake it. Repent and go on. Put off those old sinful ways and put on new righteous ways. Blessed is that man whose sin the Lord does not count against him and whose spirit is no, no deceit. Now, by contrast, we are given this, this instruction. And David tells us, through this maskel, this psalm of instruction about forgiveness. When I kept silent, that's mean when I didn't go to the Lord, when I didn't pray, when I didn't confess my sins or examine myself, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. And there is a relationship between sin and sickness. Now, not all sickness is a result of sin. Sometimes God puts us in trials. Sometimes we're chastened. Sometimes sickness is just the result of aging. And getting older and the aches and pains that come with looking forward to the end of life. But God even uses those things to help us uh, 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 change the direction of our lives. As, as he prepares us for coming before him. So even growing old can be a, a, a blessing. But, but when I kept silent, I hid this sin in my heart. 
My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. See, that burden of sin, we call it. Uh-oh, that weight. A burden is a weight. And it begins to crush you down. And, and sin causes, he said, my bones to ache. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. That's verse 4. It was like God was pressing him down. My strength was zapped as in the heat of summer. And we know a little bit about the heat of summer around here. Uh, you got to take, you, you work to about 10. Got to take a little break till it starts to cool off again. Because you, you, you or drink some Gatorade and, and get refreshed. Because it just zaps you. Well, sin does that. When we don't confess our sins, we're zapped. We're weighed down with a burden. It's as if God's hand is, is heavy upon us and, and, and our strength is that. That's the burden of guilt, the guilt of sin. That's why the blessed is. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. He then says it in verse 5, Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I didn't cover up my iniquity. Ah, that open life in which there is no conceit, in which he knows God, you can't hide it anyway. So he comes to God with an open life and tells him about it, confesses his sin. When I Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I didn't make excuses for it, or I didn't deny it. You know, well, that's really not sin, you know. Or we just pretend we, we didn't go there. But we know deep down inside it is. So we usually use denial or we make excuses for our sins. I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, this is what I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And when I did that, he says, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Not just my sin. You forgave the guilt of my sin. With sin comes guilt. The hand of the Lord heavy upon us. The burden of sin that causes our bones to ache. That causes us to feel zapped consequences of sin but if i confess my transgressions to the lord as verse 5 says and you forgave not only my sins but the guilt of my sins that this is the happiness a song about a poetry about the happiness the blessedness of having one's sins forgiven of acknowledging those sins i acknowledged my sin owning it it was mine. I sinned. I did it. Don't make excuses. Own it. Don't cover it up. Blame other people. Blame circumstances. Mine alone. Comes a great blessedness. A great joy. And that guilt is lifted from off of us. And we continue to walk with an open heart before God with no consent. No conceit hidden in our heart. Wow. Wow powerful instruction about the nature of forgiveness, a mascal. Now, to me, the greatest illustration of that, and we don't have a lot of time, so, so let me hurry along here, but the greatest is a comparison with the life of, of King Saul and the life of King David. You know, Saul was a good guy. He started out great. But in 1 Samuel 15, we read the story about uh, he was supposed to go to the Amalekites and, and destroy that sinful people that had been oppressing and uh, uh, attacking um uh, Israel also be the example of other nations, what happens uh, if you attack God's people. But instead of obeying the Lord and destroying them completely, they kept the, the sheep and the, the goats and, and, and they took pillage from it. And God told them not to do that. And so they took it and kept it. And when Samuel confronted um, uh, Saul about that, Saul made, first he said, I obey the Lord. He denied that he had not fully obeyed the Lord, but maybe in his mind, oh, I did you know, a pretty good job as obeying the Lord, right? Doing a halfway job, but no, 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 you did not fully obey the Lord, Samuel let him know. And then, instead of acknowledging his sin and take it, owning it, he says, well, the people made me do it. Yeah, the men wanted the spoil, and, and I gave in to the men, so it's really not my fault. Peer pressure. You can't blame others for the sins that we do. Now, they may have contributed to it, but they're going to have to get that right with God. Owning your own sin, and when we acknowledge our sin, even the guilt of sin is taken away. Now, by comparison uh, to David, you know, David sinned, uh, 
committed uh, adultery with Bathsheba, then arranged for Uriah, her husband, to get killed, you know, so he wouldn't have to, to, to uh, expose the pregnancy that she had, you know, and her husband would find out and all of that. And so his sin compounded. The more he hid it, the worse it got, and the more he sinned to cover it up. And yet God took Saul's kingdom away from him because he re- failed to acknowledge his sin. But David sinned far worse in his sinfulness. But God forgave him. The reason being is David acknowledged his sin before, before God. In Psalm 51, 4, you see, uh, uh, against thee and thee alone, is the old King James, I have sinned. David owned it. I did it. I didn't make excuses for it. I mean, he could have made, oh, Bathsheba was a beautiful woman. She tempted, no, no, no. He owned his own sin. But he acknowledged it before God and God forgave him. Wow. That was the main difference between Saul and David. One acknowledged their sin. One made excuses for it. Conceit hid it in his heart and denied it that he had sinned. Verse 6, Therefore let everyone who is godly pray. Pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. May be a reference to the flood. Uh, and they waited till the last minute, didn't they? And it was too late when the door was closed, when the mighty waters began to rise, it began to rain and the waters rose. But they had put it off and put it off and put it off. And I think that's what he's saying there. Therefore, let everyone who's godly pray. Pray right now. You know, right this minute. Don't put it off. Don't continue to hide it in your heart. That's deceit. Confess your sin. Own it. Acknowledge it before God. And the guilt of that sin, the burden, the weight, the aching bone, the zap strength be taken away. The blessedness. Two times over this psalm begins. Blessed, blessed are those whose sins are forgiven. Don't put it off. Pray while God can be found. And then verse 7, it, there is kind of this blessing uh, of having one's sins forgiven. Uh, and that burden being lifted. Verse 7, they cry, you are my hiding place. You will protect me when trouble surrounds me with songs of deliverance, those songs of how God will deliver us from our enemies and from those things that surround us or deliver us from the valley of the shadow of death. Because now we can walk with the Lord in perfect harmony because our sins have been confessed and acknowledged and forgiven and the guilt of them taken away. Verse 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. And again, this is a mezcal. It's meant to teach us about forgiveness. I will counsel you and watch over you. So God becomes our hiding place. He becomes our instructor, our teacher. He becomes our counselor if we have a teachable spirit. He is our shepherd who watches over us. All that from owning our our, our own sins and coming to him and confessing them and making him our hiding place. Wow. But by contrast, to walking with the Lord in that way, verse 9 says, Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by a bit and a bridle, or they will not come to you. This is the call to have some sense. Smarten up. Confess your sins, acknowledging them for God, and enter into that blessedness, and make Him your hiding place. When we sin, we tend to run from God. We don't make him our hiding place. We think we can hide our sin or we make excuses for it, which is a way of hiding our sins. We make excuses for it. It is a call to act like you have some sense. Don't be like the mule or the horse that has to be a bit that hurts its mouth, that it can be led this way and that way. Is that the way God has to lead us? Or do we run to him? Walk in his counsel every day. You know, Listen to your instructor. Listen to your teacher. Listen to your counselor, to your shepherd. Don't be a mule. Don't be a cantankerous old mare. Horse. Don't be drug here and there by a bit in your mouth. 
but come with a teachable, open, clean spirit, having confessed your sins, and let God teach you and instruct you and guide you and watch over you. Make him your hiding place. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the love, and I love this, the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. If we have faith in God to come to him, that he, if we confess our sins, he'll, he'll uh, forgive us our sins and come in faith to him, the blessedness of that, the blessedness, his unfailing love. If only we will come to him and have faith in him. The man who trusts in him, his unfailing love surrounds us. Then verse 11, it ends with rejoice in the Lord and be glad. You righteous, you whose sins are forgiven. Sing all you who are upright in heart, but you can't be upright in heart or uplifted in heart. If the burden of sin is pressing you down, if the guilt of sin is pressing you down, your bones ache, you feel zapped of strength, then why not just release it and give it to God in honest, open confession, acknowledgement, and repenting, changing the direction of your life and trusting Him that if we confess our sins again, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and then go to him as our hiding place. Right, rejoice in the Lord and be glad that Lord that surrounds us with his love, his unfailing love, you righteous sing, all of you who are upright in heart. A psalm on the lesson, the instruction on the nature, the nature of forgiveness. God bless. 